Professor Katrin Komiski now from Trinity College Dublin is going to give some wider perspectives on research. She's been engaged on both from an, an Irish and an EU perspective as well. So, Katrin, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, and thank you to the Citizens' Assembly. I appreciate that you're here at a weekend listening to us, and I don't want to talk at you. I want to talk and tell you some stories. So I'm Catherine Komiski, and I'm a professor in Trinity College, and I have been doing research in addiction for over 30 years, um, and started off looking at HIV and AIDS, and I'm continuing that work. I'm also involved at a European level. I've been involved with the European Drugs Agency for 10 years, and I've been the chairperson of their scientific committee. And I don't express a personal opinion. Everything I'm going to say today is evidence uh, research-led. So being also a teacher across 30 years, I'm going to just make three key points that I have learned that I would like to share with you from my 30 years. And those three key points, I'm delighted to see, coincide with some of uh, Professor Breeda's points. Tackle stigma. We have a health-led drug policy. Do we have a stigma-led drug policy? Tackle stigma. At Citizens' Assembly, there's only so much you can do, and we really appreciate it. I appreciate your time. But you know, you're going to be looking at top-level decisions. Tackle stigma. That's one thing I've learned have progressive policies. I'm not telling you what progressive policy. You're the ones that have taken your six months to be here. You decide what you think is the best progressive policy. But I will say to you, be progressive, be brave. And finally, being a researcher, I believe in independent research and education. So it's people like me, people will share data with me because I'm not a guard, I'm not a healthcare professional, I'm a researcher have independent research and education. There are my three points for you to take away. Why do I say tackle stigma? This is a study I did with uh, Dr. Karen Galligan in the Southeast, and this was John I met who had a very, very difficult life from a young child. If John's family had not been stigmatized, John could have been helped at a young age. That same John, I will be positive, because this is a lot of the stories are very negative, when I met John, he was now out of Dublin. He was living in the southeast. As we sat in this beautiful little room in a treatment centre, he bent down, he rolled up his trouser leg. I'm going, what's happening here? To show me where he was shot when he was 17. I'm a researcher, okay? I'm not face-to-face, -face, you know, all the time. This was quite shocking for me. But John, this day, because he's got an excellent treatment in an environment of non-stigmatising treatment, is now was when I met him expecting his second child. So there's a positive end, but look at that story. Look at that child. He was failed because of stigma. With the work with Karen Galligan, we also, and again, this is not me, this is not Catherine, this is the numbers. I have a PhD in biomathematics looking at epidemiology and HIV and AIDS and measles and all of those things. This is the numbers speaking, not Catherine. And the numbers say that for every person we know we have estimated there is just under one child. So every person known to services, there's just one under, one under, under one child. At the moment, the estimate for the number of people using heroin and opiates in Ireland is around 20,000, maybe it's 19 something. That's maybe around 19,000, 18,000 children who are in an environment where there are opiates. Just think of the stigma. Those children know what mom and dad are doing. Those children can't go out and say it to anybody. That's the numbers we're talking about because of stigma. Have progressive policies. I was delighted to see the Know the Score program. You'll see one of my posters outside there as well. I'm going to be looking at the evidence for the Know the Score program. In terms of intervention and prevention, it's really difficult to get emergency department room data. It's not centralized like inpatient data. But myself and one of my PhDs, Dr. Um, Marie Highland, we looked at 11 years of emergency department room data for young people. And I've just pulled out two case studies here. This is Oshin, and you can see Oshin was 15, and he's using alcohol and diazepam and um, cocaine. And this is where he's ending up, in the children's hospital in, in Tala. This is a story of Kira. These sto we've, we've 1,200 of these stories, children ending up in ED. All right, so what I want to say here, and this poor Kira, I mean, this could be my daughter. I have three 
daughters and one son. All right, and they're all adults and young adults. So I know what's going on. I have seen the prinks and the whatnot. All right, so I, you know, I'm a mother as well as an academic for 30 years. This is what's happening with young people. So the message I'm giving here is that we need to have prevention earlier. There are positives. We also interviewed 360 children, teenagers in Desh Band 1 schools, and we said, what protects them? Positive school environment. Not a stigmatise. You go in with dirty uniform or your homework done, you're in trouble. You should be, they should be supporting that child. Trauma-informed schools, no stigma, informing the teachers and so forth. Education research. These are what we've seen delays the onset of alcohol and drug use. And then it's not just about young people, older people the older people. We've done a study with Dr. Dave McDonough on uh, people who've been in treatment. The average time these people had been in treatment was 11 years. All right, I remember meeting a man once, and he said to me, Catherine, I used heroin for two years. I've been on methadone for 10. <laughs> you know, so these are people who are still struggling. And what we found, that people, even though they're getting their lives back together, that their childhood experiences are remaining with them into adulthood. Uh, and the most, these are some of their childhood experiences. They're called adverse childhood experiences. You can see what some of these people have been through. But do you know what was the most important, um, the most in, sort of one that affected them most? When we did the research, and again, I know there's numbers. Don't mind the numbers. Just listen to the message. The most uh, strongest factor that impacted upon them as adults was feeling unloved. Not physical abuse not sexual abuse, not the parent being in prison, was that child feeling unloved. Unloved in a family or in a society or in a school and being told they were no good. And that followed on to their adulthood. And we thought that was really powerful. And again, all of this research that I'm talking to you about today is published, it's, it's peer reviewed, you know, internationally, it's been through, they've checked the results, they've checked the methodology, they've checked the ethics, and they've said, yes, Catherine, your conclusions are correct here. These uh, are all published works. So I'm going to just remind you of my three points. Tackle stigma, have progressive policy. I'm not gonna tell you what to do. You're the ones listening to the evidence. Make your own decisions and independent research evidence. And this is a true story of a lady, I'll call her Patricia, who I found in my data over this period of 30 years. I went through all the different data sources I had over a number of years, and I said, was there anybody's turned up a couple of times? This was one lady that turned up in my data in my various studies. When she was seven, she was sexually abused. Thank you. When she was abused, do you think nobody knew? Somebody knew. But that child was not protected because maybe the mother or father were using drugs or alcohol. You know, there was stigma in, to sexual abuse. As a result, that child, when she was 15, when everybody else was doing the, was it was called then the intercert, she was injecting drugs. There were no clean needles. There was no needle exchange then. But we have it now because of progressive policy. Then when she was in her 20s, she had her first same-sex encounter. So she was obviously, you know, um, a, a gay woman. But again, it was illegal. But we have same-sex marriage now because we have progressive policy. At the age of 24, she had HIV. Again, that was stigmatized, but not anymore, all right? Because we have moved on as a country. We have progressive policy. So I'm going to say to you, be progressive in your policy-making decisions. Do not be afraid. These are my three messages based on 30 years of research. Tackle stigma. Stigma-informed policy, plus health. We've got health. Thank God we do. It's great. Tackle stigma. Be progressive. Look, that lady was let down. Let us never let down another Patricia in this country again. Thank you. Well done.